Leon found himself reincarnated into a fantasy world. Instead of a simple lamp, a grand chandelier hung above him, casting a warm glow. Candles adorned the walls, replacing the modern LED lights he was accustomed to. It became clear to Leon that he had entered a realm that lagged behind his previous world in terms of civilization. As he lay in his mother's loving arms, a maid stood nearby, watching over them. In his previous life, Leon had been an orphan who met an untimely demise due to overwork. However, his new surroundings indicated that he was born into a wealthy household. His enchanting mother assured him of a comfortable and prosperous future. The years swiftly passed, and as Leon grew older, he climbed onto a rickety chair to gaze out of the window. The world beyond confirmed his suspicion, it was truly a different realm. Witnessing Leon's precarious perch, the maid hurriedly rushed to his side, gently lifting him into her arms. She explained the danger of standing on such an unstable chair. It was during this time that Leon discovered his family's noble status. They belonged to the Grand Duchy within the kingdom. Specifically, Leon was the son of the Grand Duke of Dragonia, within the Kingdom of Lionheart. At the tender age of eight, Leon received his first sword, marking the beginning of his training as a swordsman. His eyes brimmed with excitement as he examined the gleaming weapon. Alongside his martial training, Leon wondered if he could harness something beyond his physical abilities, perhaps aura or chi. His mentor, Sir Gothic, a knight sent from the palace to instruct him, affirmed that such potential existed. Sir Gothic attributed it to the will of the goddess and emphasized the immense value in training Leon. The young protagonist, bearing the name Leon, eagerly embraced the opportunity to be taught by Sir Gothic. However, as time passed, Leon began to realize that the training was far from enjoyable, it bordered on torture and child abuse. Sir Gothic, a stern and unyielding mentor, spared no effort in imparting his knowledge to Leon. To be a knight of the kingdom, you have to complete quests by training, through experience and honor, and being chosen by the Holy Grail to drink its holy water. Leon, as the son of Dragonia, he needed to know everything to be a Grand Duke on top of his training. As he practiced with Sir Gothic, he reminded Leon to always pay attention to his opponent until the very end. During one intense session, Sir Gothic delivered a powerful blow that sent Leon flying backward, causing his sword to shatter upon impact. Exhausted and trembling, Leon collapsed to the ground, gasping for breath. Years rolled by, and Leon, now sixteen years old, embarked on a journey through the world, braving the rain. His aim was to be recognized by the deity and earn the esteemed title of Holy Knight. Suddenly, smoke billowed from a nearby forest, a village was under attack by orcs. The flames of destruction engulfed the settlement. And despite the valiant efforts of the knights, the orcs outnumbered them. In the face of seemingly inevitable defeat, the knights resorted to fervent prayers as the orcs walked towards them. In that decisive moment, a voice calls out to the orcs, calling them trash, catching their attention. Leon swiftly intervened, cutting down an orc and effectively ending the attack. Twenty years later, Leon finally encountered the deity he had sought for so long. He looked at her with eyes of wonder, admiring her beauty, and seeing why she was called a goddess, as she calls out to him. She entrusted him with a task, a test of his mettle and fate which Leon accepted without a single thought as he kneeled before her. After accepting the challenge, Leon dedicated years of tireless effort, eventually ascending to the ranks of a holy knight. From that point forward, Leon dedicated himself to a single purpose, eradicating any obstacle that stood in his path. He tore through legions of orcs, vanquished goblins, and crushed the forces of evil that plagued the land. Over time, Leon's ruthless prowess earned him the title of a war knight giving him the power to gather other knights, as he slaughtered over 700,000 orcs, even including women and children. Despite his deep-seated hatred for the orcs, Leon managed to maintain a stoic smile. Now 35 years old, Leon faced new challenges. The former king had fallen in battle against an archdemon summoned by the Empire, leaving Leon to contend with the rising menace of demons. Orcs had already given him headaches, and now these malevolent creatures roamed freely, spreading fear and terror. In an effort to restore peace to these troubled times, many sought solace in their faith and belief in the gods. Leon held disdain for the mages of the kingdom who had inadvertently summoned the archdemon, needing them to elect a holy knight to be the successor of King Lionheart who died with honor. It was due to his unwavering dedication, trust, and honor that the deity chose Leon to be the new king. Accepting the honor bestowed upon him, Leon made a solemn vow not to forsake his loyal knights and followers. He received the sacred treasure Lion Heart of the Goddess consuming it to further enhance his abilities. Swearing to protect the Holy Grail. Leon's story unfolded as he became the Grand Duke Dragonia and king over the Lionheart Kingdom. 
80 years elapsed, during which countless events transpired. Three major wars ravaged the land, each involving the orcs. A lowly goblin rose to become an archdemon, and the kingdom faced even graver perils. In the midst of these dire circumstances, a knight informed Leon about the kingdom's school of black magic, conducting perilous experiments. Leon realized that the kingdom's actions had inadvertently played into the hands of a nefarious cult residing in the north. Rallying his knights, Leon resolved to conquer this newfound threat. Ninety-six years had passed since Leon's birth, and the bastions of the kingdom had finally accomplished their grim objective. They stood amidst a ritual where the emperor sacrificed three million lives, beseeching the fulfillment of his desperate wish to cheat death. Alas, his plea went unanswered as he perished alongside the three million innocent civilians, and in the heart of the capital, the lore of chaos was summoned. Leon then gathers his knights, and took out the holy sword, that was still not dry from the previous war, from the orcs last years. 121 years after Leon's birth, he embarked on a journey to the capital. While he exerted his utmost effort, the world around him crumbled. Despite his hopes for a different outcome, Leon found himself holding a doll, a symbol of his unwavering commitment to vanquish evil. He had devoted every ounce of his being to eradicate the darkness that plagued the continent. But fate proved unyielding. Surrounded by fallen warriors, Leon clenched his fist, lost in introspection. A knight approached him, pulling him back to reality. Leon, with a heavy heart, spoke of his fallen father, honoring his memory and expressing pride in his honorable demise. He declared that his father would now feast with the gods. Casting his gaze upon his troops, Leon questioned if they, too, could hear the haunting cries of evil that swept across the land. With an impassioned speech, he bolstered their morale as the forces of evil descended upon their fortress. He asked them once again if they could hear the voices of those who had lost their loved ones to the darkness. Fueling their rage, Leon prepared his troops for a final battle. As Leon stood there, the doll he had picked up lay solemnly at a grave. He reminded his troops that, as long as they held onto their honor, they could never be defeated. In a display of his magical prowess, Leon summoned his weapon. And readied himself for the impending clash. The goddess assured him that she would remain by his side until the end. The flag bearing the emblem of the duke fluttered proudly in the air. As Leon called upon the name of Lionheart and led his troops forward. They fought valiantly against the endless hordes of demons that plagued the earth. On the battlefield, dragon-like creatures and otherworldly beings clashed, while barbarians, enslaved and forced into servitude, served as mere cannon fodder. Alongside them, civilians armed with makeshift barricades and shields fought alongside honorable knights, sacrificing their lives in defense of their homeland. Amidst this chaos, Leon, the chosen one among the gods in the holy temple, demonstrated unwavering resolve. He tore through thousands of demon lords and archdemons, showcasing his holy strength. 217 years went by, winter had yet to end, as Leon continued to fight the demons by himself for years to come. 256 years after his birth, Leon eradicated the last remaining demon portal, sealing away any possibility of escape for the demonic horde. He turns to the demons, telling them that they were not stuck in this world, with him. The demons trembled in fear as Leon declared his unwavering resolve to annihilate every last one of their kind. Without hesitation, Leon embarked on his mission, wasting no time in dismantling the demonic forces. Three hundred years after his birth, he single-handedly vanquished a colossal demon, disposing of it within seconds. A group of astonished onlookers gathered near the fallen body, perplexed by the swift turn of events. Their eyes widened in disbelief. As they look at the decapitated head of the demon, their collective gaze shifted towards Leon, who radiated a yellow aura, an undeniable symbol of his power. They wondered who this extraordinary individual could be. Leon, now among mortals once more, introduced himself as the King of Lionheart. And the envoy of the Holy Temple. The humans stood in awe, staring at his naked presence, as Leon told them his name, Leon Dragonia Lionheart. A gate ominously opened in the midst of Seoul, its nature eluding classification. The Korea Hunter Association and the World Hunter Association swiftly sent out a request for assistance to the largest guilds. However, due to the lack of a thorough assessment of the portal's difficulty, their plea for help was met with refusal. Eventually, it was decided that a team from the Korea Hunter Association, resembling a suicide mission, would be sent in. The members of the association couldn't help but display their fear in the face of this perilous undertaking. As they entered the portal, the sky itself seemed drenched in blood, and they found Leon standing naked. The ground was littered with the lifeless corpses of thousands of demons. Shaking off her daze, Hari snapped back to reality. 
another man named Kim Janu handed her a cup of coffee. He inquired about what had transpired. Hari expressed her disbelief, stating that no one would believe what they had witnessed. Understanding the gravity of the situation, Jin Su calmly acknowledged that such an outcome was to be expected. It became apparent that the portal they had faced was likely in black ranked black demon portal, possibly even harboring a great demon. The fact that they had returned unaided by other guilds was a true miracle in itself, and the daunting task of cleaning up the aftermath seemed unimaginable. All of this was attributed to their encounter with Leon. Leon, now fully dressed, sat at a desk in an interrogation room. It had become clear to those observing that he was a survivor from within the depths of the portal. Occasionally, individuals managed to survive within the worlds contained within these portals. For the past thirty years, these portals had been appearing randomly across the globe, always depicting a world on the verge of destruction or one already engulfed in chaos. Some fortunate survivors, like Leon, made their way back to Earth, carrying with them the incredible strength they had gained in the demon world. The government made it a priority to provide for and recruit these survivors, understanding the significance of their abilities in order to scot them. Hari emphasized the need to recruit Leon due to his incredible strength, a sentiment that Jin Su wholeheartedly agreed with. Even an A-ranked hunter would have to risk their life when facing a high-ranking demon, yet Leon had effortlessly defeated one with a single strike. It was a monster that even S-ranked hunters would fear. He didn't just kill it. He completely overpowered it. However, Jin Su expressed concern regarding the cultural implications of Leon's presence. Hari, less worried about such matters claimed she could sense something in Leon's voice. In a sudden outburst, Leon's anger reached its peak, causing the glass surrounding him to shatter. The shards scattered, interrupting their conversation, leaving Hari and Jinsu amazed by Leon's display of power. Enveloped in a yellow aura, Leon's rage became apparent. Sarcastically, Jinsu echoed Hari's previous words, while she, in turn, echoed Jinsu's sentiments. Fifteen minutes earlier, a camera had recorded the conversation while an agent diligently took notes on a flat piece of paper. This agent engaged in a conversation with Leon, an experience that felt unfamiliar to him. Memories of his past life as an orphan in his twenties, succumbing to exhaustion, and being reborn as a king for over a century flooded Leon's mind. After conquering the world of demons, he hunted demons for two hundred years. Despite his actual age of three hundred years, he was relieved to still have memories of this place. The agent mustered his courage and addressed Leon, who maintained a focused expression. Leon saw no advantage in revealing his origin from Earth and instead insisted on being addressed as His Majesty, belittling the agent as a mere peasant. This unexpected response somewhat surprised and shocked the agent, evident by the beads of sweat forming on his forehead. The agent played along, offering apologies and continuing to address Leon as His Majesty. Leon contemplated whether the agent was genuinely kind or if this was how all survivors would be treated by the government. The agent proceeded to explain to Leon that their world had made contact with his and inquired if he had indeed defeated all the demons. Leon confirmed his triumph, prompting him to question whether the agent had already forgotten. Perplexed, the agent expressed his confusion, and Leon proceeded to clarify that he had eradicated all the evil and protected the honor of the knights. With conviction, Leon demanded that the agent become his temporary secretary. The agent, recollecting the situation, once again found himself covered in beads of sweat understanding that there would likely be cultural differences that came with addressing a royal figure. Amidst their conversation, Leon expressed his hunger, which compelled the agent to swiftly order food. Additionally, Leon yearned to understand the world he now found himself in and the extent of its changes in recent years. The agent began explaining that portals had emerged worldwide three years ago, unleashing monsters and demons into their realm. Following these incidents, the world had remained in a perpetual state of alertness. After numerous defeats, it became apparent that each portal held its own theme and quest that needed to be fulfilled. If the quest went uncompleted, monsters would continue to emerge from the portal, attacking Earth. Just as the agent began his explanation, there was a knock on the door, prompting a pause. The agent excused himself momentarily to receive the food. Leon contemplated the stark contrast between his world, where demons multiplied like mushrooms after rain, and Earth, where portals with distinct themes and quests existed. It seemed as if people were training themselves through these tasks. Returning to the conversation, the agent, now addressing Leon as his majesty, informed him that the food had arrived. As Leon glanced down at the steaming bowl of food, he recognized it as his favorite meal from his previous life on Earth. 
However, he suppressed his cravings, aware that he must not indulge in his former favorite food. Inquiring about the nature of the dish, he remarked that it seemed fit for a commoner. In a fit of rage, Leon shouted and pounded on the table. He screams at the agent, yelling how they dare to serve a royal, a peasant's dish, as the agent cowers in fear. Leon was a royal from another world, the proxy for the gods. As he tells the agent to get out of the room, he held multiple titles, being the incarnation of the history of the 300-year war itself. Leon thinks of the place as a mess, believing it was because there was no proper religion faith. Of the delectable food that had been placed before him remained untouched on the floor, its steam slowly dissipating. Before him lay a juicy steak, expertly cooked and accompanied by a sprinkle of rosemary and a few slices of lemon. Leon indulged in the succulent T-bone steak and complimented it with a sip of a vintage red wine from the year 1933. Hari, appreciative that Leon at least enjoyed the meal, Jean Su suggested that she should enter first. Jean Su's suggestion startled her as she realized she couldn't speak the ancient language, mentioning that Leon seemed more interested in Hari than the others. He further noted that Hari was the only one who had received the compliment from Leon. Nervously, Hari opened the door to the conference room and greeted Leon, who wiped his mouth and recognized her as the woman with the sword whom he had saved. He requested that she take a seat. Observing the scene from the surveillance room, Hari suddenly signaled to Jin Su, causing beads of sweat to form on Jin Su's face. Inquiring about the food, Hari asked Leon if he liked it, to which Leon replied that it wasn't bad. Leon then explained that it wasn't the food itself that made it difficult for them, but rather their attitude toward a king. Hari's face turned blue with realization, expressing her lack of awareness and regret for not showing him enough respect. Leon reassured her that it was all right and politely asked for her name. As Leon's eyes sparkled with focus, he inquired whether the demons had also appeared on earth. Hari, aware of her task to recruit Leon, confirmed his question. Determined to win him over for her country in the 21st century. She believed that gaining survivors like Leon was a crucial factor that could potentially lead to a world war. Regardless of how much they offered in return as long as they didn't join another country. Leon, still focused, stated that as long as he lived in this world, he had the duty to take to the battlefield as an honorable knight, for fighting was the only righteous path. Hari's excitement grew, as it almost sounded like Leon was considering joining the Hunter Association. Leon then clarified that a king couldn't simply be a soldier of a nation, therefore, he desired to establish a knight order. Hari was left speechless, nodding in agreement. She inquired about the response of the higher-ups to this matter. Jean Su explained that they couldn't say anything, as they had to provide Leon with as much support as he needed. Jean Su expressed his amazement that Leon hadn't chosen to go to another country or join a larger guild. Hari, feeling somewhat dejected at the thought of the government having to bow down to him, couldn't help but feel angry. She voiced her frustration, citing other guilds that flaunted their strength and wealth, particularly mentioning the Phoenix Guild as an example. Suddenly, the ground shook, and an alarm blared. Hari and Jean Su received a message on their phones, alerting them that a portal was on the verge of breaking out, releasing monsters. Jean Su explained that if the demons were to appear in that location, they would destroy at least half of the grain storage and production. Hari insisted that the portal needed to be closed, specifically in the area controlled by the Phoenix Guild. She believed that it shouldn't be a difficult task for their S-rank leader. However, Jean Su had a different perspective and believed that their leader, Yun Won SSI, had other plans in mind. He expressed the urgency to go quickly and stop the impending disaster. Meanwhile, Leon overheard the conversation and realized that they were in trouble. He understood that things were different in this world compared to his own. Controlling the flow of his yellow aura from his hand, he wondered if they would be able to handle the situation. As a result, a connection was established, and a castle came into view, with a woman inside. She turned around, revealing a beautiful smile. Above the fields, an orange portal circled, indicating the imminent danger. Li Yong Wan, the guildmaster of the Phoenix Guild, was already present at the scene as Hari and Jin Su asked him what was happening. But the Phoenix Guild remained relaxed as Hari and Jin Su stared at them in anger for not doing anything. Jin Su's desperation was evident, while Yong Wan wore a dirty grin on his face. Hari expressed her anger, emphasizing that the Phoenix Guild already enjoyed numerous privileges as a large guild, yet they were willing to allow such calamity due to unmet demands. Hari confronted Yong Wan, the leader of the Phoenix Guild, in a fit of fury, questioning if he understood the consequences if the plants became infected. Yong Wan simply laughed in a derisive manner, claiming he had no idea, and that his guild members were injured. Instead, 
They will try tomorrow, this frustrates Hari as she yells at him as Jinsu holds her back. Yeowon simply laughs at her. Reminding Hari that he had previously stated. That justice was merely strength and money. You, re quite shallow and old-fashioned, Leon said as he appears. Hari called Leon by his name by accident instead of your majesty. As Leon tells her he only permitted her to call him by his title. Yeowon yells at Leon, asking who he think he was, as Leon tells him to be quiet. Angry veins visibly pulsated on Leon's face. How dare someone speak as lowly as you speak? Leon shouted. Yeowon thought to himself about how someone can talk like this to an S rank in Guildmaster. Yeowon was on the verge of attacking Leon, but was halted by Hari, who implored him to stop. She explained that Leon was a survivor, which left Yeowon in a state of shock. He promptly bowed before Leon, acknowledging his status as a survivor. Yeowon, curious about which guild Leon belonged to, was met with Leon's stern emphasis that a king doesn't speak twice and that he should remain silent. Leon turned to Jinsu, urging him to explain the problem and the portals to him. Hari and Jinsu were overjoyed at the turn of events. Hari explained that this situation was a dungeon break, and when it occurred, a great demonic energy emerged from the portal, infecting the land. Seeds would not grow in such contaminated soil. Furthermore, they emphasized that this land was crucial for grain production, making it particularly critical. Leon, determined, asked if they had a solution. Hari explained that the dungeon needed to be defeated swiftly to cleanse the land. Understanding the gravity of the situation, Leon asked Hari to gather her people. He made it clear that as soon as the deadline set by the Phoenix Guild expired the following day, he would personally venture forth to defeat the dungeon. Hari couldn't believe what she was hearing. However, Leon emphasized that he needed the government's permission to proceed. Otherwise, he wouldn't be an honorable knight anymore. Young Wan, realizing that Leon's circumstances were even more challenging than his own, called the president to request permission, which was granted. As night fell, Hari informed Leon that all the preparations had been made. She couldn't help but wonder about the significance of the straw doll she was supposed to create for him. Leon elucidated that their land was infected and needed to be cleansed. Puzzled, Hari struggled to comprehend the connection between the straw doll and the land. Leon requested two things, the straw doll itself and that the women who crafted the dolls had to be mothers. Leon now wanted to see each doll that the women had made. With curiosity, Leon carefully examined each doll. But none met his expectations. He discarded them, throwing them on the ground or casting them aside. Eventually, an elderly woman approached, capturing Leon's attention with her beautifully crafted doll. Leon was amazed by its artistry. He asked the elderly lady how many children she had given birth to, and with enthusiasm, she replied, Twelve. Leon kissed her hand in reverence, took the doll, and placed it on an altar in the center of the grain field. He declared that the condition had been fulfilled. A magical circle materialized around Leon's hand as he retrieved the Holy Grail and began to pray. Even Young One watched in disbelief. From the Holy Grail emerged a golden globe, and the water within multiplied. Hari stood in awe as the water overflowed and the sun's rays began to shine upon the land. The water sprinkled all around, rejuvenating the soil. Leon closed his eyes, allowing the magic to unfold. The splashing water flowed into the doll, and the guild's followers watched in amazement as the doll stood up on its own end. Began to speak. Leon greeted the doll, addressing it as Mother Earth. The doll, its gaze fixed on Leon, responded, It has been a while. Divinity had descended on this land. The doll looked at Leon and spoke, revealing that the land they stood upon was also contaminated by demonic energy. Leon nodded in agreement, explaining that while demons existed in this world, there was no deity to protect it. He expressed concern that the lowly beings of the Phoenix Guild would insult the Divine Presence. Damara, the name of the Mother Earth, tells Leon that ignorance and greed cannot always be judged as sins, as those are built-in characteristics of a mortal. Intrigued, the doll asked Leon about his intentions. Leon tells her that it was easy to blend in amongst the swordsmen, but the authority of a conqueror is divine. Hence, he conveyed his desire to lead the people, to teach the ignorant and lead them to the right path. Until a new pantheon arose on earth. The doll offered her unwavering assistance, always ready to help. Leon began to pray to the goddess, hoping that even if it wasn't her land, she could still heal and purify it for the people. The doll extended her hand, despite it not being the goddess's home, and allowed a drop of her divinity to fall. A radiant beam of light shot toward the sky, illuminating the initially gray plants. 
To the amazement of Hari, Jin Su, and their comrades, the plants started regaining their color. Leon commanded everyone to watch and learn. As this world was blessed with a deity, the rice fields stretched out, now radiantly golden as far as the eye could see. Fertility and prosperity emanated from the land, a testament to the tasks of living beings. Hari and Jin Su looked on in disbelief at the transformation. As Leon spoke about the eternal promise of fertile soil, visible annoyance flickered across Yamwan's face. He angrily and frustratedly remarked that they shouldn't be blinded by plants created with magic, deeming them poisoned. Leon retorted that these were plants blessed by a deity and sternly criticized Yamwan for his flippant tongue, warning him not to insult the deity again. Yamwan swallowed his despair, the evidence of his failure apparent on his face. Yamwan's followers were unaware of their leader's failed plan, as Leon's actions had thwarted it. But Yongwan thought to himself that he can't let that happen, and wants to expose Leon's lies. Determined, Yamwan suggested that they first prove that the rice was not poisoned and hoped that Leon would cooperate. An expert evaluator was provided by Yamwan. The expert put on gloves and used magic to examine the rice. Astonishment washed over him as he observed the magical status window, which indicated that the rice was blessed and could completely heal curses. The evaluator, taken aback, announced his findings, that the rice was all rare-ranked, and it cures tier 3 diseases and even cancer. Hari and Jin Su were amazed by the revelation. Jin Su called for a pot from the chief's house. And with a golden rice field as the backdrop, a small pot stood in the middle, cooking rice. Jin Su tasted the rice and was pleasantly surprised. As his stamina and mana regeneration increased, he marveled at how such simple rice could be as powerful as a million enhancers. Excitedly, Hari rushed over to Jin Su, speaking with food in her mouth. Jin Su commanded her to finish eating before talking. And once Hari swallowed the food, she eagerly shared her discovery. She explained that her curiosity led her to eat a beetle. And to everyone's surprise, she gained a buff as well. They concluded that the entire land had been blessed. Jin Su ordered his people to gather as much rice and bugs as possible, as they would enter the portal with full buffs. The deity spoke to Leon expressing that she had fulfilled her task there and needed to return. Leon expressed his gratitude, promising that he would never forget the love and sanctity she had imparted. As a final lesson, she reminded Leon to take care of himself as well. With those words, the doll toppled over, returning to its dormant state. Hari turned to Leon, seeking answers about everything they had just witnessed. Leon explained that it was divine power at work. Leon questioned whether there was no God in their world, but Hari unsure of the concept. Leon clarified that a good life and a good world are made with divine power, urging people to embrace this notion. Now that the soldiers were satiated and at their maximum strength, they were ready to enter the portal. One of Yamwan's followers inquired if it was okay, considering they might interfere with the plan. Yongwan glared angrily at the follower, insulting Leon and claiming that without him, the government would have complied with their demands. Undeterred, Leon, Hari, and Jin Su set off towards the portal. Yongwan had an idea and reassured his follower, asking if anyone had ever entered the portal before and how challenging it was inside. The follower mentioned that the center of the portal was particularly difficult. The follower realized what he was getting at. Among the group, Hari was the only A-rank hunter. Young one, viewing Leon as a mere supporter lacking combat experience, sinisterly anticipated the group's defeat. Knowing that a true monster lurked within the portal, one that couldn't be defeated by conventional means. Having entered the portal and arrived in the dungeon, our group proceeded cautiously. Jin Su led the way with a shield, while Leon stood behind him in the middle, and Hari positioned slightly ahead. Leon understood that most portals would close once the task or boss inside was completed or defeated. He relished the idea of facing a boss, making Hari unable to tell him it usually required a team battle. Observing the skeletons strewn across the ground, he noted that there seemed to be ablet more monsters than he thought. Hari replies that it was a characteristic of the dungeon. She explained to Leon that while the number of monsters decreases as you defeat them in most gates, in the case of skeletons or zombies, or even special demons in special cases, as long as the boss monster is alive, they'll infinitely respawn. Leon finally understood that it only ends if the boss is defeated. He hinted to her that this must be one of those boss dungeons, which she agrees with. Suddenly, a window materialized in front of Hari indicating that it was on the verge of shattering, and they now had a time limit of three hours. The boss monster would gather its troops. 
frozen in place, everyone felt the weight of the impending challenge. Jin Su cursed Yong Wan, while Hari appeared somewhat nervous. In contrast, Leon remained unfazed. Their attention was drawn to a hand gripping a knight's helmet, its eyes emitting a haunting blue glow. On a rocky perch, a horse reared up on its hind legs, and thousands of skeletons loomed before the rock. Another window appeared, displaying a countdown of 2 minutes and 58 seconds to defeat the knight on the horse. The skeletons prepared to launch their assault, casting a shadow of doubt and lowering the group's morale. Seeking to boost their spirits, Jean Su attempted to rally the group, emphasizing the need for concentration. A skilled woman armed with a bow activated a skill that allowed her to discern the number of enemy mages and archers, expertly commanding the group. Jean Su directed snipers to eliminate long-range fighters and instructed tanks to block the advancing skeletons. Thousands of skeletons closed in. Launching their relentless attacks. Jean Su skillfully blocked their initial strikes. Realizing their strength surpassed his expectations. Unyielding, he countered with swift and precise movements. Shattering the skeletons with the prowess of a B-rank tank. Amidst the skirmish, Jin Su noticed. Two mages casting spells behind him. Determined to divert their attention, he shouted loudly through the cave. Drawing the mages' focus. Magical projectiles flew toward him. Causing concern among his comrades, but Jin Su managed to withstand the onslaught. Now, the headless knight stood before Jin Su, emitting an aura of menace. Unfazed, Jin Su locked eyes with the formidable foe. The knight, clad in black armor and surrounded by a blue aura, struck at Jin Su. Although Jin Su barely managed to block the attack, he was forcefully thrown back. Landing amidst a pile of rocks. Worry gripped Hari as she witnessed Jin Su's plight. Eager to assist him, a member turned to Hari, seeking guidance on the next move. With no time to wait for reinforcements, they needed to find a solution urgently. Hari approached Leon. Hoping for his assistance. However, Leon remained calm. Stating that a king doesn't intervene in insignificant battles. Perplexed, Hari struggled to comprehend Leon's words. He suggested that they find ways to build their own honor. Frustrated by Leon's apparent indifference, the group turned to Hari, seeking direction. Although she didn't fully grasp Leon's message, she realized that he had no intention of helping. With time running out, Hari's focus shifted solely to the headless knight. Unsheathing her sword, Hari made up her mind to defeat the boss. Encouraging the rest of the group to support Jin Su, she fearlessly charged forward, cutting through the ranks of skeletons. She used a skeleton's head as a springboard, propelling herself higher, matching the level of the headless knight. Hari unleashed a powerful strike, aiming for the knight. But he deftly parried her attack with his great sword. Despite her disappointment, Hari understood the importance of separating him from the group. To her surprise, she noticed that the knight had discarded his head and was preparing to launch a devastating attack with his fist. Hari braced herself, attempting to block. But the impact sent her flying backward. Determined, she quickly regained her composure. Only to find the headless knight standing before her once again. She had partially achieved her goal of separation. Apologizing to her comrades, Hari's range of skills were too large. Suddenly, a colossal explosion engulfed everything in sight. Yet, the knight managed to block it effortlessly. Unyielding, Hari launched another attack, driven to end the battle. Meanwhile, the knight blocked each strike. Seemingly unscathed. Observing the knight's blade block the blunt of her attack. Hari notices the stance the knight was taking. As it swings its blade towards him. She closes her attacks just as the attack reaches her. But a voice interrupts the fight, shouting impressive. Leon stepped forward clapping his hands apologizing to the headless knight for underestimating him as a mere undead creature. Extending a noble gesture, Leon offered the knight the opportunity to engage in an honorable and noble duel. Leon walks towards Hari and the death knight, saying there was no need for more troops to be injured. Let us end this fight with a noble duel between two knights. Leon shouted with pride. Hari, Jean Su, and even a skeleton in their midst couldn't believe their eyes, wearing expressions of astonishment. The headless knight remained silent at first but ultimately accepted the challenge. The skeletons lurking in the cave took a sudden interest in the captivating showdown between Leon and the Headless Knight. They approached slowly, their hollow eye sockets observing the unfolding duel with utmost attention. Leon, standing confidently before the formidable foe, spoke with a mixture of arrogance and respect. He summoned his sword, its gleaming blade catching the faint light, and issued a command to the Headless Knight to remove his helmet. 
The knight remained silent, his intentions veiled behind the armor. Leon confidently stated that he was certain the knight fought with a two-handed sword, which put him at a disadvantage. With unwavering determination, Leon enveloped his sword with a vibrant yellow aura, a manifestation of his skill and power. Hari, sensing an imminent clash, approached Leon and informed him that the headless knight would not be defeated unless he was decapitated. Leon, unfazed, asked if that detail was crucial to their victory. Frozen in astonishment, Hari replied that it was indeed important. She wondered how Leon planned to emerge victorious if he couldn't execute the decisive blow. The headless knight, realizing the significance of their conversation, handed his head to one of the skeletons serving him. Leon, taking a moment to explain his perspective to Hari, emphasized that the outcome of the duel would be determined by the knight's sense of honor. Leon and the headless knight assumed their respective starting positions, their focus unwavering. Leon spoke his name aloud, expecting a reciprocal introduction from the knight, but the knight remained silent. As soon as Leon announced the beginning of the duel and finished uttering his own name, the headless knight grasped his sword with certainty and charged forward, unleashing a powerful attack. However, to Leon's nonchalant surprise, he effortlessly blocked the strike, his skills far surpassing the knight's. Leon keenly observed the knight's movements, almost seeing through his intentions. With swift precision, he parried the attack, redirected its trajectory, and lightly touched the headless knight. Leon counted, one. Readying his sword again, Leon pointed it directly at the headless knight, his voice resonating with determination. Following his self-imposed motto, he declared, the second round begins now. The headless knight, undeterred, raised his sword, positioning himself once more for a formidable assault. Hari and Jean Su, observing the intense clash, grew increasingly worried about Leon's safety. Leon, ever the discerning critic, criticized the flawed footwork of the headless knight and swiftly brought him down. Jean Su and the rest of the group could hardly believe their eyes, their faces reflecting a mix of astonishment and bewilderment. Hari found the turn of events nearly unbelievable. Jean Su turned to Hari, seeking confirmation of what had just transpired. Hari, her voice filled with awe, explained that Leon had deftly altered the trajectory of the headless knight's sword at the precise moment their blades made contact, executing a daring crosscut. A maneuver that few would ever attempt. Undeterred by his defeat, the headless knight stood up again, his determination unyielding. Leon, displaying a mix of admiration and amusement, lightly touched him with the tip of his sword for the second time, once again counting the strike. 2. Leon instructed the headless knight to return to his starting position, acknowledging his opponent's resilience. The duel between Leon and the headless knight continued. Each clash of their blades a testament to their skill and unwavering resolve. The headless knight launched another assault, but Leon, maintaining an unwavering posture of honor and grandeur, accepted each attack with poise, expertly blocking and countering with ease. Leon, with a flick of his wrist, tossed aside the headless knight's sword and lightly touched him for the third time. Leon asked the knight if he wished to continue, offering him a chance to honorably yield. The headless knight, who preferred to fight as a knight rather than rely on magic, charged at Leon once more, launching a relentless series of attacks. However, Leon effortlessly parried each strike, his movements flowing with a grace that belied the knight's raw power. Leon didn't even need to exert himself while the headless knight grew increasingly fatigued. Just before Leon touched him for the tenth time, he skillfully disarmed the knight, flinging his sword away. Leon commended the knight, acknowledging the improvement in his swordsmanship, and asked if he was starting to regain his memories from his past life. Affirming Leon's inquiry, the headless knight expressed his desire to continue the duel. He called upon one of his loyal skeletons, which held his detached head, and lifted it up, indulging in a moment of reminiscence about his past. He pondered how long he had fought without honor, lamenting the wasted years. The headless knight, filled with newfound purpose, declared that ending his life in this honorable manner would bring him joy. He lifted his head and offered it to Leon as a symbol of their duel's significance. Leon, filled with a mix of joy and respect, accepted the once headless knight's gesture. Placing his hand on the knight's head, he offered a prayer, a gentle plea for solace and rest. A bright light illuminated the cave, its radiant glow emanating from the night and spreading throughout. Leon expressed his wish that if the night had a god, that deity would grant his soul respite. And if no god accompanied him, Leon hoped that a benevolent force would guide him to the end of his journey. Leon expressed his desire to reunite with the night again someday, perhaps at a festival in the halls of the gods. The light grew larger, enveloping the night's helmet and armor. 
which dissolved into nothingness as the Death Knight lets out one final prayer, let glory lie with Leon Dragoni Lionheart. As the brilliance faded, the group found themselves back in the familiar surroundings of the rice fields. Hari, full of admiration, informed Jean Su that Leon had indeed kept his promise, resolving the matter through a duel. They pondered the nature of the magic Leon had displayed, its intricacies and origins. Hari remarked that Leon should have used that remarkable ability earlier in the battle. Overhearing their conversation, Leon explained that if he had done so, the headless knight would have perished as a necromancer. Hari greeted Leon, appreciating his wisdom and adherence to the principles of honor. Leon continued to elaborate, emphasizing that a true knight lives for honor, and honor is born from deeds. Deeds can only happen when one possesses the will to undertake them. The headless knight, in the end, received what he deserved, an honorable defeat that restored his lost honor. Leon wondered aloud about the whereabouts of the knight's loot, shifting the focus to their next objective. Hari, Jean Su, and Leon inspected the spoils of the duel, the knight's sword, a cloak, and a mysterious purple ball radiating with a vibrant violet aura. Hari and Jean Su were surprised to see the loot, where else Leon remained unimpressed. Leon immediately noticed the ball's significance and, much to Jean Su's dismay, destroyed it without hesitation. Everyone was stunned at what had just happened. Leon tells them that such items only brought chaos and destruction, harboring powers best left unutilized. Thus concluded chapters 1-6 of The Night King's Return, an epic tale intertwining mortals and gods, honor and redemption.